Okay. Hello, welcome everybody. Let's uh, share this screen. Skill, let me know that I'm screen sharing okay. And you see that? You're looking good. Beautiful. All right, everybody. Welcome to Letterform Lectures Online Edition. My name is Grendel and I am Education Director at Letterform Archive, which is also the home of Type West, our school of type design. And as usual, we have an international audience today. So let us know where you're coming from in the chat. Uh, whoa, okay, we got uh, 97 participants already. Excellent. Uh, and if you have questions for the speaker as we're going along, please drop them in the Q&A and upvote the ones that you'd like to see answered that helps me stay organized. And first of all, I wanna give a big shout out to Skilla Zaccolini who is responsible for the magic on the back end of this lecture series. Thank you so much, Skilla. Um, just a quick reminder, pandemic is not over yet. And the best way to prevent spread is by masking. So don't listen to the CDC, listen to me. Uh, mask up when you're indoors, <laughs> all right. Um, we do have a trifecta of cool events that just happened or are currently happening. We've got Pride, Happy Pride, everybody. Happy Juneteenth and Happy Summer Solstice today. Let's celebrate the longest day of the year. Okay. Like I mentioned, Letterform Archive is the home of Type West. Um, we've got a bunch of online and a few in-person workshops uh, in 2022. So check our website for more details on that. Uh, before we get rolling, I'd like to announce that the Type West Certificate Program in Type Design uh, classes of 2022 have not only completed their first term and revived a typeface like Lazarus from the dead. The online class created a website to showcase their revivals. So go to uh, typerevivals.com to see what they've done. Okay, here's a few upcoming workshops that I wanna tell you about. We have a brush written Imperial Romans calligraphy workshop with Paul Herrera, who is none other than the longtime apprentice of the legendary Father Kadich. This workshop is in person at Letterform Archive on July 30th and 31st, don't miss it. And by the way, all our in-person workshops require appropriate masking and physical distancing and we have excellent ventilation and high grade air purifiers that filter out those pesky viruses. Um, next up, we have our crash course in type selection with our very own Stephen Coles and Christopher Sly. That's going online. So everything you ever wanted to know about choosing type, but we're afraid to ask, this top team of type experts will get you started on the path to making great type choices. They will also give you tips on how to organize and better use your type library. This is great for beginners and professionals. We also have an exploration of Hong Kong type. So type designer and scholar Adonian Chan walks us through the history and subsequent reincarnation of Hong Kong type while indulging us with some of Hong Kong's calligraphic secrets. So don't miss this next letter form lecture that's happening at a special time, 6 p.m. Pacific time. That's due to Adonian's time zone. Okay, make a note. Then the aforementioned Paul Herrera will be in town for this special in-person letter form lecture. We'll be back at the SF Public Library for the first time in over two years. So join us on Tuesday, July 26th at 6 p.m. Pacific time in the lovely Caret Auditorium for this exciting talk about Paul Herrera's inspiration process and the challenges of recreating the Trajan inscription in Slate. This will also be live streamed and recorded for our international audience. Okay, for more information on our upcoming letter form lectures, our salon series, and the workshops and events as they happen, go to letarc.org slash events. Better yet, become a Letterform Archive member. Stay in the loop, get cool perks, and help keep great lectures like this one going. 
So go to letarc.org slash join and become a member today. Okay, finally, be sure to follow us on Instagram to stay on top of upcoming events and programs. And we've got two Instas. We got Letterform Archive and Type West. Check them both out. Okay, welcome to Summer Letterform Lecture Series. This is our first one, Summer 2022. And Letterform Lectures are co-presented by the Letterform Archive and the SFPL, Letterform Archive is a nonprofit institution that houses at this point over 75,000 works of graphic design history. We are dedicated to the art and the craft of the letter form. 85,000. 85? Jeez. Okay. Woo. Uh, we'd like to thank, I stand corrected. We'd like to thank Adobe for generously sponsoring the video recording of this lecture series. And you can view all Letterform lectures online soon after they happen. Just check our website, letterformarchive.org. Okay, we are honored to welcome our speaker today, Lauren Ellie DeGain. Lauren Ellie is a letterpress enthusiast and a printer who recently received her master's in English from the University of Victoria. And she brings her feminist analysis to her research on 10 women type designers whose work on metal typefaces has largely gone unrecognized. And we are thrilled that she will share her findings with us today. Okay, Lauren Ellie told us, this is an interesting anecdote, that she's very particular about having things just so. When she was four years old, she threw a tantrum about not having the specific cup she needed for her bedtime glass of water. And the tantrum she threw was so extreme that her neighbors actually called the police. Um, although she, she's quit having such vocal tantrums, she hasn't quite gotten rid of the tendency to dig in her heels into something. So when she started on this project, she had to follow it to its logical conclusion, even though it meant doing way more work than was technically required to satisfy the master's degree. So today she's here to share the results of that inability to do anything halfway. Welcome, Lauren Ellie DeGain. Thank you so much, Brendel. It's so good to be here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. All righty. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you so much to our host, thank you, Grenda, thank you, Scylla, and thank you so much for inviting me um, to give this presentation today. Um, my name is Lauren Ellie DeGain. Um, I recently received my master's in English from the University of Victoria. And today I'm here to talk about my master's research project. Um, and before I dive into my presentation, I just want to show you um, the actual print uh, project itself. Um, so this is kind of the final form of the project. Um, and we created 20 print, uh, 20 print copies of this project. Um, you'll see it's a large format folder. Um, the image on the front, what, it's a lino image. It was printed by me and designed by a local artist, Stephanie Williams. And the calligraphy was done by a local calligrapher, Renee Alexander. And when you open the folder, on the inside, you have uh, five metal type specimens on the right and the essay booklet on the left here. So I just wanted you to kind of have a visual image of that as we go into this project. Um, and one exciting thing that I will mention is that I am going to be donating one of the 20 copies to the Letterform Archive. I'm very excited uh, that the archive will be receiving this. Um, so if anyone is in the San Francisco area and wants to check out the type specimens or any aspect um, of the project in person, you will be able to do that. We're gonna get that down there as soon as possible. <laughs> um, and uh, I also wanted to mention, you'll see um, that Scylla posted in the chat. 
a Google Drive folder with the presentation slides for today. So if you want to follow up on anything that I mentioned, you should be able to do that by downloading the slides. Um, also, a big part of this project was creating an open access digital uh, version of this uh, print edition um, through my university library. So it is available online for anyone. You're very welcome, Brendel, for anyone to view um, online right now. Okay, so with that, I will get started with my presentation. And it's asking me for my password. Sorry about this. Oh, just a moment. So today we are here for the presentation, Searching for a Woman's Type, Uncovering the History of Early Women Type Designers. And I'll start by saying happy National Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, here in Canada, June 21st is National Indigenous Peoples Day. And I also wanted to acknowledge yesterday's marking of June Juneteenth. Um, and so I know that uh, this may not be the case in every community from which you are joining, um, but where I am, it, it's good protocol to begin with a territory acknowledgement um, when we gather together. So acknowledging um, the Indigenous peoples um, who uh, this land is the ancestral home of. Um, territory acknowledgements remind us whose land we are on and that we're gathered to participate in activities that benefit our communities and the upcoming generations. Today, I'm joining you from a city that is known by many as Victoria, British Columbia. And this is Lekwungen territory, the ancestral lands of the families and communities known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Lekwungen means place to smoke herring. The word Lekwungen references the territory and also the language of the first peoples of this land. And the Lekwungen people have hunted, gathered, and carefully managed the land here for thousands of years. I wanted to show a quick clip that features members of the Lekwungen community sharing their thoughts on reconciliation and the importance of learning and practicing their culture, in particular, their traditional agriculture. How we've paid attention to our ancestors, how we've paid attention to our elders, how we've listened to the land and water resources around us. That's the discipline that I hope our next generations understand. The most important thing you can do is learn everything you can about the Lekwungen people because this is her land. It's to educate people about the truth of our history, talk about colonialism historically but colonialism today and those impacts to land and culture and health and community and to our relations whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. The opportunity to educate is so very important. Some people are never going to see what I'm trying to tell them as far as the truth of the history and why things are so important to who I am as Lekwungen and to our Lekwungen future and to the health of our people. You know, just developing those relationships and it takes time. Um, and, um, and I think that's one of the things that Indigenous and non-Indigenous people do to uh, build, start building that relationship is on the ground. I think it's an important part of learning and hands-on learning. So people will walk these landscapes and be able to say, okay, yeah, I can see how this is important to the Lokwangan people today. And to even acknowledge that we live today. We're still here, we're still alive. And our culture is still thriving. So very grateful for that beautiful video. And I think it's important to be aware that territory acknowledgements alone um, they don't mean that much if they're not embedded in a broader range of action. So as an uninvited guest on this territory and as someone of settler ancestry, I do commit to taking action toward the goals of reconciliation and decolonization. Okay, so I'll give you a quick overview of the presentation. Um, we'll start uh, with the background. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'll get to know a little bit about you and then I'll tell you about the project. And then in part two, um, we'll dive into the meat of the subject, early women type designers and their types, and then we'll have a Q&A. 
While I'm here, I'll also mention that unfortunately, I wasn't able to follow all best practices for creating accessible slides. I've done my best, but it's not quite perfect. So if anyone does go to the Google Drive folder and download the slides, if you have any specific accessibility issues, please feel free to email me and I'll try to help. Um, also, I know that long presentations can be a little bit one note sometimes, so I tried to make this presentation interactive by including links to polls and opportunities to share your thoughts in the chat. Um, but if you're the kind of person who gets overwhelmed by like swapping back and forth between screens um, or trying to like open and close the chat and that kind of thing, um, please know that you can just hang out and watch the presentation and you'll still have a great experience. You may also want to have your smartphone handy because you can use that to participate in the polls as well. All right, so rolling right into part one, background. I thought I'd give you a little bit of context about me just to sort of provide some context for the project. So for me, um, letterpress printing was really a gateway to research and type design. I'm not a type designer um, and I'm not, I, I wouldn't really con consider myself a, a really a letterpress printer. I mean, I'm a bit of a novice, I love it, but um, I, I haven't had the opportunity to really get embedded in it. Um, but I did take my first letterpress printing class as a bachelor's student at Naropa University in Boulder, Colorado. And on the top right there, photo one, you can see the Harry Smith print shop. That's the print shop at Naropa. Um, and then in 2013, I received my degree in writing and literature with a concentration in poetry. And in 2015, I moved to Canada and started a work trade at a print shop in Shirley, BC called Cook Kettle Press. And it was quite part-time, but it allowed me to uh, learn a bit more about letterpress printing um, and actually you know, get my hands in some ink and some type. And so photo two on the bottom right there um, is uh, me getting ready to print one of the specimens, the type specimens for this project. All right, so I'd love to know a little bit more about the audience today. So uh, Phil is going to post a link in the chat. Please click on the link in the chat to participate in the poll. It will take you to the Mentimeter website, and then you can come back to the Zoom meeting once you're done answering the question. Um, if you want to leave the presentation up on the monitor, you can also use your smartphone for the poll. So you'll just go to menti.com and you'll enter the code that's going to come up at the top of the screen here. So you can either click the link in the chat or you can go to menti.com and use the code 23680640. So this is great. Yeah, so I wanna know a little bit about you came here today, uh, who, you, who you are. Are you a, a printer? Are you a designer? Are you a student? Are you a, um, are you a professor? Professor, and in particular, I'd love to know if anyone has experience with letterpress printing. So if you're a printer, please put that in the chat, or maybe you're a print enthusiast or a novice printer, please put that in the chat. <clears throat> Looks like we've got a lot of graphic designers. We've got some printers, that's great. We've got type designers, that's exciting, students. Uh, when you're done answering, Menti will ask you if you want the results. You don't have to put your email in if you don't want to. Um, you should be able to see the results together on the screen here. But if you want to, um, you can receive the results and then you'll see when it's all done. All right, so we've got a lot of participation coming in. I see the word feminist. I see the word learner, print enthusiast. That's great. So it looks like we do have quite a few printers in the audience. That's awesome. All right, so thank you so much for sharing. That was really fun. Um, so now that we uh, know each other a little bit better, um, let me tell you a little bit about the project. So it really began in the fall of 2017. I was letterpress printing the covers for my poetry checkbook, and you can see those in photo one on the right-hand side. And I go into this a little bit in my essay, but I really wanted to use a typeface that was designed by a woman to print the covers. And so the natural first question was, well, what are the metal typefaces that were designed by women? And I was kind of surprised um, that this answer was not readily, the answer was not readily available to me. 
Um, the first resource that I found was uh, an article in the blog Alphabet by Indra Kupfer Schmidt called First and Early Female Typeface Designers. Um, but it wasn't kind of a complete overview. And a lot of the lists of women type designers, um, they don't really specify whether the designers work in um, digital type design, metal type design, or even photo type design. I also was able to uh, reach out to uh, in individuals in the trade, such as Wolfgang Hartman of Bauer Type. Um, and eventually I found a font or a set of 36 point Colwell hand letter italics on eBay for $79. Um, and so I purchased that um, and Elizabeth Colwell actually ended up becoming the central subject of my research. On the right hand side there, you can see that typeface Elizabeth Colwell, uh, Elizabeth hand letter, sorry, Colwell hand letter italic. Um, and then I, I really just enjoyed the process of researching this. It was a creative project, but um, I got really uh, kind of carried away. And so in 2019, when I began my master's at the University of Victoria, I knew that I wanted to um, go into this uh, area of research for my ma major research project. So this project is part of a lineage of scholarly and printerly interest in the history of women in print. Um, this is a list of 20th and 21st century studies of the topic. <laughs> of course, there are many resources, um, but these are the, some of the ones that I'm familiar with. We are on a tight schedule today, so I won't review this list, but you'll receive it in the slides if you want to have a closer look. This is probably also a good time to mention that this project would not have been possible without the generosity of a long, long list of printers, archivists, researchers, type designers, digitization professionals, and more. So many people shared their time, their resources, and knowledge with me. Um, and I couldn't possibly begin to acknowledge everyone today, although I try to do so throughout my paper. Um, some of you may even be in the audience today, so thank you so much. And I have to give a shout out to my mom and my aunt, who I know are in the audience as well. So moving right along. Oh, I see some hearts coming in, that's nice. So um, what is this project? First of all, it's an essay. It's illustrated biographical sketches of women who designed metal typefaces prior to the advent of, oh, sorry, that says printing, but it, it should say uh, computers, <laughs> my bad. Um, prior to the advent of computers. Um, and it is also brief description of their typefaces, including some light art historical context um, and possibilities for contemporary printers and designers to use them today. So on the, in the photo on the right hand side, you'll see kind of a typical page from the essay at the top is sort of the research portion and then there's some um, citations in the margin and then the figures uh, to illustrate with some captions. And Jan Westendorp, the book designer, um, did such an incredible job with this. I cannot thank her enough. Um, this project is also a collection of material. Um, so it's a portfolio of five newly printed specimens using original metal type. Um, it's also a collection of metal type and print materials. And on the right hand side there, you'll see the collection. So I personally own three metal typefaces designed by women, and I'll, I'll talk about them later. Um, and then it's also a collection of open access digital resources. And I'll touch on a couple of those as well. I also want to talk about what this project is not. Um, it's certainly not the last word on women's early women's type history. There is so much more to learn. Um, in fact, Stephanie Qualls recently did a, um, a finding aid at the letter form archive. And I think she might've uncovered um, even a few more names to add to the list. Um, and then this is also not a study of how these women's type design practices or conditions were different than men. So it's not a study of the gendered nature of their work. I do some of that analysis throughout, um, especially in the chapter on Elizabeth Colwell, the, the primary um, subject, um, but it's not the main goal of the project. And I do think this is a really important area for further study. Um, but I, I 
hope that the project kind of lays the foundation, gives some particular evidence that people might use to um, start doing or continue doing that work. So like I said, it's not the main goal of the project. So what are the goals of the project? <laughs> you gotta have goals, right? So the first goal is to create an open access reference for letterpress printers wanting to use metal types designed by a woman. And this is really to solve that initial problem that I had as a printer in the print shop looking for a metal type designed by a woman. And I really wanted it to be an open access resource so that were no barriers to being able to access this information. And the second goal was to generate new interest in these women's work for today's printers and designers. And I think that the design and material elements of the project were crucial to generating new interest. You know, it might not have been quite as engaging if it was just an essay. And I'll talk a little bit about how I was able to share some of my research with contemporary designers working on digital revivals of typefaces. And I wouldn't have been able to do that without collecting the metal type and printing the type specimen. And then as well, through the production of the essay booklet and the type specimen portfolio, I was able to solicit the contributions of a network of printers and designers, which generated interest in the project as well. So there's this archival aspect, as well as the research, and then the print and design component. So there's a lot of entry points for people from different areas of interest, and there's a lot to engage with, and I, just, I think it's really exciting. And then the last goal was to highlight and share the history of early women type designers, hopefully fostering further study on gender in the history of type design. Okay, so before I go any further, I've got to define my terms here. So for my project, early women type designers means women who designed alphabetic typefaces that were cast into metal by commercial foundries prior to the widespread use of computers and design software. So most of their type designs were issued in the period circa 1910 to 1960. And so this only includes women who were attributed with a typeface. And I go into more detail about this in my paper, but this excludes women who had a hand in the design of a type, such as Anna Simons or Bertha Gowdy, or the women of Times New Roman, which are the subject of a recent um, article by Alice Avoy. Um, it also excludes uh, the typeface pilot. Um, so in the photo on the right-hand side there, you'll see a specimen for the typeface pilot by Alexandra Semulenkova. Pilot won the Fine Press Book Association's 2013 student type design competition, and it was cast into metal by Ed Rayer of Swamp Press. So this is available for letterpress printers, and it's a type designed by a woman, but it was designed after the advent of computers and design software. And so at the heart of it, the scope of uh, this project is really the result of my interest in letterpress printing with antique materials. But during my research, I also discovered that this is a really distinct period of time for both the field of typography and for women's entry into the workforce. So a lot of interesting factors there. So based on this definition, I, you, you might want to take a personal guess as to how many uh, type designers I was able to find in my research. And before I answer that question, let's do a quick round of trivia on early women type designers. So a link will be posted in the chat. Please click on the link in the chat to participate in the poll. And it will take you to the Mentimeter website. <clears throat> and you can come back to the Zoom meeting when you're done. Um, there's two questions for this poll. Um, if you want to leave the presentation up on your monitor, again, you can use your smartphone for the poll. Um, just go to menti.com and enter the code 4460-8212. And again, when you're done answering Menti Walk, if you want the results, um, you don't have to do that. We're looking at the results together right now. So the first question is, which country were most of the women type designers in my project from? <clears throat> It looks like we're getting a bit of a consensus here. Oh, or maybe some more votes for England. And so I think we're, oh, England is catching up a little bit. Um, and then the second question is, what was the most common style of typeface that they created? So text face would be um, a face that's useful for printing uh, long blocks of text, like paragraphs in a book. Display face would be one that um, is 
used for headers or titles, um, something in large, large sizes. Ornamental capitals are just that. They kind of draw the eye in, often used at the beginning of a paragraph or just to um, be decorative. And then black letter typefaces, it's a family of fonts um, inspired by medieval calligraphy. And it looks like uh, the consensus, or not consensus, but the, um, the sort of group vote is for display face. And then for um, the first part, question, I think the group vote is for Germany. So let's go back to my presentation. And now we will find out the answers to our question. So part two, early women type designers and their types. This slide is titled The Women and Their Types, an overview. So if you had a guess on how many designers I discussed, you would be right if you guessed 10. And again, I will note that this information was to the best of my knowledge at the time of writing. I very much hope that there will continue to be more added to this list. Um, so gotta love a spreadsheet. Um, here we see um, there's kind of two sections, the women and their types. And this is how the essay was formatted or organized as well. In the first column, you have the designer. In the second column, the name of the typeface. And in the third column, the year of their design. And so this is how the essay was organized, a chapter, if you will, on each woman. The first part being a biographical sketch with all of the information that I could find. And then the second part of the chapter being a description of their typeface designs. And then at the end, um, a set of images to illustrate the chapter. So if any of these names capture your attention, you can scroll through the project and find them in the essay, see what types they created, learn a little bit about the women. Um, and see if the typefaces might be available today in some form, perhaps the digital version for you to use in your print shop or design studio. And so most of these women came from affluent or artistic families and or had husbands or fathers working in the book and printing trades. And there's a couple of exceptions. So that's Selena Andreevna Danikova, that's row six, and Elizabeth Colwell, row one, who came from working class backgrounds. And Francisca Baruch and Elizabeth Friedlander, um, Francisca Baruch's in row five and Elizabeth Friedlander's in row eight, were both Jewish women born in Germany who had to escape from Germany in the 1930s. You'll notice that most of these designers only created one or maybe two typefaces. As designer Jerry Kelly once said, one type design does not a career make. So most of the women could not really be said to have careers as type designers, but it was one aspect of their work. The exceptions to this are Gudrun Zafon Hess in row nine, and that she was the most prolific of the bunch, and Selena Banikova. On this slide, the women and their types, a slightly deeper dive, I go into a little more detail about the women and their types as a group. And this is where we see the answers to the trivia. So most of the women were from Germany, so if you chose Germany, you're correct. And a few people have asked me why, and the truth is, I'm not really sure. It was not a question that I dealt with in my paper. And in fact, there may be some of you in the audience who have a broader knowledge of type design history. I'm really welcome people to put your hypotheses in the chat. Or maybe you actually know the answer and you can put it in the chat. Um, as I said, most of the designers only created one or two designs in their lives, Zafon Hess being the most prolific, so I thought you might be interested to know what their primary occupations were, and that's what this word cloud on the bottom left describes. So you'll see that the, um, the kind of most common occupation was graphic designer, typically working in the book trades, you know, maybe designing book covers or doing typography or illustration, um, patterned papers, um, also a, lot, uh, a fair bit of teaching. Um, general kind of artist um, occupation um, and some lettering, printing as well. In terms of the typeface style, you chose uh, display face in the trivia, um, but that's not quite right. <laughs> if you chose text face, you were correct. Um, and so this is maybe a good place to highlight uh, oh, and then I also wanted to mention that um, the alphabets that were covered in my project were Latin, Cyrillic, and Hebrew. Um, and so this is maybe a good place to highlight the fact that these results, these research results are quite Eurocentric. 
Um, and that could be a matter of circumstance, just the fact that I'm only able to speak English. And so most of my searches were done in English. Um, I, I did do um, some research in German and Russian as well, although that was one of the most challenging aspects of the project. Um, it could also be my focus. Um, you know, I wasn't asking who were the women who created metal Arabic script typefaces. So there's gaps in my research, still many more important questions that my work doesn't answer. Um, and if anyone is aware of a project that focuses on the first or early women type designers working on alphabets other than the ones I came across, please put your sources in the chat. So now that we've talked about the women and their types as a group, are you ready for a whirlwind tour of early women type designers? Up first is Colwell Handletter and Italics by Elizabeth Colwell. This typeface was issued by the American Type Founders Company in 1916, and these images are from their 1923 specimen book. The Roman is on the left and the Italic is on the right. Colwell Handletter is a Jensen style typeface. Jensen style typefaces take their inspiration from the letter forms of 15th century Venetian printer Nicholas Jensen. They evoke the human touch of handwritten letter forms while retaining a uniformity of shape and an evenness of weight that makes them really legible. As its name suggests, Colwell hand letter exhibits a strong calligraphic influence. This can be seen in a few different ways, but in the extremities of the letter form. So what would be the beginnings and endings of the pen stroke? The features of each character are unique. Um, some letters taper smoothly at the stroke endings. Some characters feature teardrop terminals, a gentle swelling at the tips into a teardrop or almost ball shape, while others have more abrupt or angular serif. And some letters exhibit more than one of these features. My favorite letter, the italic T, has a little bit of all of them. And the T actually has so much character that it, it, it inspired me to defy grammatical conventions when I was printing the covers of my poetry chapbook. I, I capitalized the word the, um, even though you're not supposed to really capitalize that in a title, because I liked how the T's curling horizontal stroke sat atop this strong pillar-like vertical stem. Um, some might find this heterogeneity or variety of Colwell hand lettered style unappealing, but I think that the typeface balances variety and uniformity in a way that makes it distinctive without being overwrought. Um, what do you think? I'd love to hear your thoughts. So please feel free to share um, your ideas or thoughts, opinions about Colwell hand letter in the chat. Um, but at the end of the day, the success of the typeface will depend on its usage. Uh, created in an era, oh, we've got some applause. Yes, the reactions are great because I actually can't see the chat. I will look at it after, but um, I do like the reactions because then I can kind of see um, what's going on. Um, so uh, yes, I was saying uh, the success of it kind of depends on the usage. So it was created in an era where formal stationary invitations and announcements were still common. Ooh, lots of applause and hearts. <laughs> Um, so the typeface, I think, kind of shows its design best in uses that allow for ample margins and complementary ornaments or borders. Um, using Colwell hand letter in an uncomplicated layout allows the eye to kind of appreciate how each letter flows into the next. And I think the design works really well in service of subjects relating to the realm of humanity and society, uh, rather than, for example, like technology or machinery, just because of those kind of hand-formed origins. I wanna talk about the contemporary possibilities for using Colwell hand letter today, but quickly I want to note that I think Elizabeth Colwell is a really interesting figure. And in my paper, I give a detailed biography of her. She was born in 1881 and lived in Chicago's Hyde Park neighborhood for most of her life. <clears throat> um, I was even able to get my friend in Chicago to take a picture of where she once lived, which was very exciting. Um, that's photo two on the top right. And there are aspects of her working history and her typeface itself that are interesting to consider through a lens of gender dynamics. So if that piques your interest, I encourage you to check out her chapter in the project. And in terms of contemporary possibilities for the letterpress printers in the room, 
responsive Colwell hand letter or such a Colwell hand letter can occasionally be found on eBay. That's where I found mine. Um, and a letterpress printed specimen using that is included in the project. Colwell hand letter matrices or the molds used to create the metal type as well as drawings of the typeface are held by the Smithsonian American History Museum. That's the photo on the bottom right there, photo three. Um, they can't be used to cast type, but perhaps measurements for new matrices could be taken. And then finally, digitized versions are a possibility. So photo one on the left is the cover of my essay booklet designed by Jan Westendorf. And Jan used Carla Paston's digital revival of Colwell hand letter called Sonnet, which is just beautiful because uh, Colwell was a poet herself. Um, this was a project that Carla did as a student at Type West. And I was able to send Carla high resolution images of some of the individual pieces of metal pipe to help her identify the anatomy of some of the letters. And that was just a really exciting thing for me to do. Kind of the whole point of the project um, is to help people learn more about these figures. Um, and, and spread the resources to a wider audience. Yes, I, I have a, a clap too. I'm very excited about this. <laughs> um, okay, so next is Belladonna by Hildegard Henning. Hildegard Henning may be the first woman attributed with a type design. Her typeface Belladonna was issued by the Julius Klinkard Type Foundry circa 1912. Um, it, I was lucky to purchase Belladonna metal pipe from a letterpress shop in Germany, which I used to print the type specimen that you see here. I came across the type very serendipitously on Twitter, where it was shared in a tweet by type designer Maria Ramos, and I purchased it for 35 euro. The design appears to be a hybrid between Roman and black letter styles. It's more ornamental than classic Roman, but wider and more open than classic black letter. So it's not like heavy or angular, um, like the typefaces we think of as being like characteristically Gothic or metal. In terms of contemporary possibilities, Belladonna metal type is probably quite rare, um, but there are exciting possibilities in the realm of digital revitalization. Um, in early 2021, students in the Type West program were assigned the task of creating a digital version of the typeface, of a metal typeface, any metal typeface. And graphic designer Tamara Segura, who I know is here today, hey Tamara, chose to work with Belladonna. Um, it was a great honor to be able to provide Tamara with some images of the typeface to help her with her project. So with the typefaces, black letter tones, I think the design would shine in any application that requires a hint of the late medieval world or the old world more generally. So perhaps as the house font for an ironwork company, or on the label of a bottle containing wine made from a Rhineland grape. Next up are the ballet initials. The ballet initials were designed by Maria Ballet and issued by Bauer Type Foundry in Germany, probably around 1929. Maria Ballet was a graphic designer working in Germany in the 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, I was able to find very little biographical information on her. The typeface is a capital only script style ornamented with a swirling vine and leaf decoration. In Germany, the design was advertised as a companion for the script typeface Schoenschrift, uh, designed by Lucian Bernhardt in 1925, which has both upper and lower case. Um, the foundry sold the initials in large sizes, indicating its intent for display and decorative purposes. I was lucky enough to acquire a full set of these initials from letterpress printer Tim, Tim Dunn, who also contributed a newly printed type specimen to the project. And the Bound & Co. print shop in New York also has a selection of the initials. Um, and I only found out about that because they posted photo two on the top right on Facebook. <clears throat> For digital versions of the ballet initials, designers can use these really lovely Ali initials. And those are in photo three on the bottom right. Those were issued by, um, in, in 2005 by Berlin-based foundry AS type. And one interesting feature of this typeface is that allow, it allows the user to layer and add color to specific design objects, like the ornamental leaves or the white space carved out of the main downstroke. So just really cool. Um, and then for typographers who are interested in using the initial, initials as originally intended, as a companion for Lucian Bernhard's uh, script typeface, the Digital Foundry Elsner 
and Flake sells in a, a very attractive uh, ver digital version of Shonshrift. So let me know what you think um, in the chat, but I think the ballet initials are really lovely. I think they're well suited to typographical uses that call for a touch of flimsy or a particular kind of retro decorative stylization. So like maybe the playbill for an outdoor staging of a Midsummer Night's Dream or the menu for like a cute little cafe or the signage for a boutique florist or garden shop. Getting lots of hearts in the chat. This, this one is really lovely. All right, next up, Thomas Schrift by Friedel Thomas. So Thomas Schrift and its all capitals companion, Thomas Versalian, were issued in the late 1950s by the EB Typo Art. Although I recently found out from type designer Ferdinand Ulrich that the type actually, the design actually predates the EB's release. So this is just one example of how there's a lot more to uncover than I was able to address in my project. And Frida Thomas was born in Poland in 1895, and beginning in 1922, she worked as the director of the print shop at the Bergki Bekenstein Art University in Halle. She was also a teacher there later in life. Uh, the typeface pictured in photo one at the top can be described as an unseal based typeface with simple rounded shapes and slightly flared ending characteristic of wasting strokes which have wider tops and bottoms and thinner centers. So you can see this in the lowercase i, l, and q, and you can see it in the uppercase h and i. Um, Unseals were widely used by European scribes for Latin and Greek in the early medieval period, and designers with a renewed interest in the style brought them into the realm of 20th century typography. I'm not currently aware of any metal type existing, but there are two digital versions of Thomas's design. The first is Cohen Hoffman's Thomas Schrift and all capitals Thomas Schrift for Salian, which were issued in 2015 by URW Type Foundry and are available on myfonts.com. And there's also Ralph Unger and Georg Schiller's version, version Thomas Schrift um, on photo, photo three on the bottom right. Um, and that was issued in 2014 by RMU Type Design, and it's available on spotshop.com. So in my opinion, this design is very charming. Let me know what you think. Um, it has kind of a handmade character that feels really warm and sort of unshowy. I get the sense that these designs would shine in applications that call back to a pre-industrial past where things were made by human hands, using natural materials. So for example, I could picture this being used for the branding of like a neo-medieval pub that tries to take its patrons back in time with like bespoke furnishings, dim lights, wood paneling, that kind of thing. Um, or maybe embossed in gold on a leather bound fantasy novel or on the poster for an autumn beer festival. I'm seeing some hearts and applause in the chat. So let me know. Next is Sam by Francisca Baruch. So this Hebrew typeface, Sam, was designed by Francis Francisca Baruch for Berthold Type Foundry in the mid-1920s. Baruch was born in Germany in 1901, and in 1933, she immigrated to Palestine. Baruch settled in Tel Aviv and pursued a successful career as a designer. Baruch's typeface can be seen in the context of the search for a new Hebrew type. This search began in Europe and Israel in the early 20th century. As graphic designer Ada Wardy explains, the Hebrew language, which was until then sacred and used for religious purposes, became slowly an everyday language, end quote. This expanded use of the language created practical and cultural reasons for typographers to work towards updating the Hebrew script. Baruch was among a group of designers working to create a new Hebrew typeface that would, as Ada Wardy described, suit and represent the new developing culture and also fit new pr printing techniques. In the 40s and 50s, Sam became very popular in Israel as a display face, in particular for use by the Israeli government. Um, I'm not aware of any extant metal fonts of Baruch's typeface design, so I'm not aware of any metal type for this one, um, but the digital version can be purchased from linotypes.com. Next up, we've got 
Banakova by Galina Andreevna Banakova, issued by Polygraph Match in Russia in 1949. Um, and poly Polygraph Match is where much of the typeface de design um, in the Soviet Union took place at the time. And the photo on the right is an example of the typeface in use as printed in a magazine published in Moscow in 1950. Banakova was one of the two designers, the other being Gudrun Zafonhez, um, who can be considered a career type designer. Uh, she began working for Polygraph Mesh in 1939. Um, and this typeface is a Roman text face meant for use in books of fiction. According to Paratype Digital Foundry, Banakova is actually considered one of the best original typefaces of Soviet typography. Um, and the design was inspired by Renaissance humanist typefaces and the 18th century civil type. So the Roman typefaces um, that resulted from Peter the Great's reform of Cyrillic types during his reign. And in terms of contemporary possibilities, uh, graphic designer Rustem Gabazov relayed to me that a small Muslim print shop in Ufa, Russia, uses Banakova metal type for limited print runs of stationery and other items. And it's entirely possible that other metal types exist as well. And in 2001, Paratype issued a digital version of Banakova. And as with the original, the digital Banakova would make a good font for novels or other long works, um, particularly that uh, those that are written using the Cyrillic alphabet um, or those that pertain to subjects of history, culture, and society. And we actually used a, a, a typeface from a very similar, from a similar lineage, um, an open source typeface called PT Serif um, for the, for setting the uh, text of the essay booklet as well. And it's a really lovely typeface and that's open source. So free to use. Next up is Elizabeth Roman and Italic designed by Elizabeth Friedlander and issued by Sour Type Foundry in Germany, circa 1938. On the right-hand side, you can see the new type specimen that Jennifer Farrell of Star Shaped Press in Chicago contributed to the project. Friedlander was a successful designer and enjoyed a wonderful career in Germany, Italy, and England. Pauline Talker wrote a great working biography of Friedlander, which was printed in a limited edition by fine printer Incline Press in England. Um, for my project, my library and I gained permission to digitize the rare book and share it open access online. It's a really exciting way to share these resources with a wider audience. Lots of hearts coming in for this one. It's so beautiful. Um, in terms of contemporary possibilities, I have not yet seen any metal types for sale. Um, Jen Farrell of Star Shaped Press has a large collection and a handful of print shops in the US and England also own the types. Um, Bauer Types sells a digital version of the typeface, which could be used in digital design um, or to create photopolymer plates for letterpress printing. And maybe this is a good place to say that any of the digital versions of these could be used to create photopolymer plates for letterpress printing. And any of the typefaces that don't yet have the digital version, maybe they could be created and then those could be used either for digital designs or for photopolymer plates. Um, upon issuing, the typeface was named Elizabeth, despite the usual custom of naming a typeface with the designer's surname, since uh, Friedlander's surname would have been recognized as Jewish. The Bauer Foundry's director at the time, Georg Hartmann, called it one of the best and most beautiful ever produced. Of all the typefaces discussed in this paper, I believe Elizabeth is the most versatile. The Roman's legibility makes it useful for setting long blocks of text at small sizes, but it can also be used as a display type. And the italic is classic, but with elegant flourishes that would fit well with uses such as formal stationary invitations or chapter titles. So how would you use Elizabeth? Let us know in the chat. Next up is Rhapsody by Ilse Schul. This was issued by Ludwig and Mayer Foundry in Germany in 1951, and it was issued with a set of ornamental uppercase or swash capitals. According to the book Women in the Graphic Arts, the typeface was, quote, widely disseminated. 
And Rhapsody is a black letter typeface, but I think it has like a bit of roundness as well as reduced contrast between the thick and thin parts of the strokes, which give the design a little bit more of a fluid look as compared to more angular or narrow black letter typefaces. Um, today, Rhapsody metal type pops up on eBay occasionally, um, and I'm aware of a handful of printers who own it, such as Norman McKnight, who printed the, the type specimen on the top right. Um, and then really exciting digital versions of Rhapsody were designed by Ralph Unger in 2006 and by Cybope in 2001. And Cybope's typeface, X Masterpiece, can be downloaded for free, which is really cool. Um, and this version is exciting because it also includes the Splash Capital. Okay, now we come to Gudrun Zafon Hess, who is of course in the heavyweight class when it comes to early women designers of metal types. Uh, Gudrun was a German typeface designer, calligrapher, bookbinder, and artist, and she passed away only recently in 2020. Mrs. Afon has created metal, photo, and digital types as she was working throughout the transition in type technologies over the course of the 20th century. Lots of hearts coming in for Gudrun Afon has. Um, so these are just her four metal types. Um, since Mrs. Afon Hess's typefaces are among the most popular that I studied, I won't go into them too much in too much detail because there's lots of info online. Um, in my opinion, they are all quite stunning. Um, in my paper, I go into quite a lot of detail about Mrs. Afon Hess and her types and contemporary possibilities for using them. I will say that I was very, very excited to work with Leonard C. Stone of Tideline Press in New York, who owns a Diatima metal font and printed a new type specimen for the project. That's photo one on the top left. Photo two on the top right shows an all capital display type, Hess and Sequa. Uh, the type designer, Ferdinand Ulrich, um, who I believe may be here today. Shout out for Nan Ulrich. Um, and uh, Fernand has done quite a bit of work on Hassan Antigua and he and Mrs. Zafon has created a digital version in lots of hearts and <laughs> applause. Um, uh, he and Mrs. Zafon has created a digital version in 2018. Um, the image here is a print created by, by printer Matt Kelsey in Saratoga, California. Um, he used the digital version to design a photopolymer plate, um, which he then used to letter press, letter press print this specimen. So that's kind of that process that I was talking about earlier. This is a great example of that. Um, photo three and four on the bottom are both all capitals display types. Marag is an inline style face and Ariadne is a lovely script style. Um, and both of these images are from Mark and Cynthia Batty's book on Zap on Hess. Last but certainly not least is Anna Maria Schildbach's typeface Montan, which was issued by the German foundry Simple in 1954. Um, Schildbach was born in 1924 and worked as a graphic artist at Simple Foundry in the 1950s and as a teacher in the 60s. Um, the image here is Simple's specimen of Montan, their brochure for um, commercial purposes, um, issued circa the 1950s. Um, the typeface has its lineage in the grotesque or sans serif typefaces of the 19th century. Um, when compared to the other typefaces in this project, Montan, in my opinion, represents a sort of step in a modern, almost utilitarian direction. It's bold, boxy, unadorned sans serif. Um, it's got a heavy stroke that's the same width throughout the letter forms, almost as if stenciled. But because some of the angles are rounded, it doesn't come off as harsh or rigid. And I think this is well demonstrated in the E, the letter E. A Montan is an uppercase only typeface, useful for headlines, titles, posters, and advertisements. I'm not aware of any metal types currently existing. However, Rainer Gerstenberg Type Foundry in Germany still casts metal type and has the matrices to cast Montan. It is quite costly, otherwise I myself would have some type made <laughs> worth every penny for sure. Yeah, lots of hearts for that and a wow react, <laughs> yes. Um, I've heard that Mr. Gerstenberg may be retiring soon, but his website is still online. So if anyone is interested in having a set for their letterpress print shop, please make haste. It would be amazing if there was, you know, some sort of material trace of this 
work uh, in the form of metal pipe. Um, I'm also not aware of any digital versions of this typeface, which is unfortunate because I personally think it's very cool. If I had my own letterpress shop, I think I might use this typeface the most out of the bunch. I like working with large format projects and this would make a very cool font for posters and other projects where you kind of want to make a strong statement. I also think it would be useful for those stylistically simple greeting cards that have cheeky sayings on them, like a Valentine's Day card that says, you're the peanut butter to my jam. In my paper, I write that if combination of bold shapes and organic rounded corners might also suit a laid back aesthetic. So for example, um, like the beer bottle labeled for a West Coast microbrewery or something like that. Anyway, I think this mid-century style is very versatile and somehow both trendy and timeless. That's just my opinion. Let me know what you think. And that is that. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, I hope you enjoyed this whirlwind tour. Um, it's time for the Q&A and I'm going to get started. I would love to know which typeface was your favorite. So Skill is going to post a link in the chat to a poll and the same way we've done before, you can let me know which typeface was your favorite. Um, I'll leave these up for a bit just to kind of refresh your memory before I head over to the, um, to the poll to see what the answers were. So maybe if people want to answer the poll while uh, while folks are thinking of questions that they would like to ask. We've got some hearts and thumbs up. I'm curious to see what's happening in the poll. I'll just head over. Oh, I, I some lots of people agree with me and they really like Montan. That's cool. And yes, lots of votes for Mrs. Afwan Hess's wonderful tight faces. It's so cool to see, like, I'm really um, glad that you guys are enjoying these typefaces. Um, and maybe we'll, uh, I'll pass it back over to uh, Brendel maybe to um, facilitate the Q&A, um, if that sounds good. And you can, of course, put your email into Mentimeter if you want to receive, like, the final results for this. It seems like most of the responses have come in. Um, but I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Laura and Ellie. That was <laughs> fantastic. So well researched oh, and you. presented. I'm really, really appreciative. Um, and there's, oh, is, there's more to learn, right? But this is a fantastic um, opening to that. Um, we have some questions for you. Tampa okay. asks, okay. which one is your favorite? Oh man, of course. That's like asking me to, <laughs> yeah, like asking me to choose like which dog or which of my pets or which of my plants is my favorite. Um, I don't have any pets, so. I can't choose a favorite, but if I did, it would be hard. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I really like Montan. I just think it's so cool. I think it's the mo one of the more unique out of the bunch. Um, I, I have a really a soft spot in my heart for Colwell Hand Letter because that was the one that I, I thought first and that was the one that um, I researched the most. Um, but I mean, I just, yeah, I mean, I'm obviously biased, but I think they're all pretty cool. Okay, I understand. It's like picking which of your favorite, your children is the favorite or something. It's yeah. Not, yeah, it's not right. Um, okay, uh, Montan, how is that spelled? I think I screwed it up. M-O-N-T-A-N. Oh, 
I spelled it correctly. Okay, nice. um, Susan M would like to know what does the future of female type designers look like? Uh, you know? What is the future? What is the future of female, female, type, designers? female type designers look like? Okay, um, well, I think that for that question, a really good place to start would be Yulia Popova's book, How Many Female Type Designers Do You Know? That is an excellent book that really speaks to that topic of contemporary women in type design. And for my part, I don't know if I'm particularly well placed to answer that question because I'm not a type designer, I'm not working in the field, um, but I do know that there are some really uh, amazing, obviously uh, type designers, women type designers working right now, many of them who are probably in the audience. And a few of them are at Type West. Go students. That's right, yeah. I was, hey. I was gonna say there, there are many of them up and coming right now. I was so thrilled to see that your presentation highlighted a few of our, our grads um, uh, revivals. That was really cool. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. That was one of the most rewarding aspects of the project for sure. Is hooking up with uh, contemporary women type designers, right? That's right. Yeah, being able to provide some resources to help them with their work. Exactly. And then you got the revivals afterwards to play with. That's, that's right. Yeah. Um, we have a question here from Anonymous uh, who asked, okay. somewhat off topic, but I'm curious, since you sought out and acquired several of these as metal type while working on this project, where is the boundary or crossover between research and collection for you personally? That's such a good question. Um, I mean, it, uh, my brain is like exploding right now. <laughs> um, I yeah, that I don't know if there is a boundary. I think that they are totally um, interlinked. I mean, all almost. I mean, all of my research was archival research, really, except for the research done you know, on eBay and commercial websites and that kind of thing. Um, I think archives are really important. Um, you know, the metal typefaces are a concrete physical uh, trace of this era of, of type history. And, um, and so, I mean, for me, that's kind of one of the most exciting things is having these and they need to be used. So I do hope that at some point you know, right now I'm just kind of hanging on to them. So they they need to be used anyway. That's that's what I think. And <laughs> I don't know if that's a good answer, but I think that really hit the nail on the head, actually. I mean, I as a, a letterpress printer, um, I personally feel that all, all type, all the metal type, it needs to be used. That's the main thing. If we want to keep it alive, we have to use it and get it out there that's in circulation. That's exactly right. And I think that's kind of one of the reasons why I really focused on trying to provide some ideas for how that might take place. Because yeah, I just, I love letterpress printing machines. I wanna, I, I love the fact that there's kind of been this letterpress renaissance. There's a lot of people doing letterpress as their job, you know, and, um, and it would be super cool um, if some of these typefaces could make their way back into um, commercial work. Okay, let's see. Oh, Ferdinand Ulrich asks, did you come across female type designers who are not from Europe or North America in your research? And then Stephen Cole says, I think Bethany added a few Russian designers to the list after Lauren's research. But did you, um, did you have any additional findings? Or have you since you completed your research for the mouse? I have not. No, I have not. Um, and I will say that after I finished my research project, I, I haven't been doing a ton of research since then. I've mostly been resting and I worked as 
is a, uh, a public servant now, so I do, uh, I'm of a policy analyst for the provincial government. So um, I, I don't, I haven't had time for not, not haven't had time, but I just, I haven't kind of continued the research myself. Um, so I haven't come up with any new information. Um, so the short answer is no, um, but I think that that does, that would be really great if that happened. Have you been? And, I, oh, sorry. No, no. I was just going to say, I don't think that we should assume that there aren't any either. I think we should assume that there are and and go go on the hunt. Yes. Sorry. What were you going to say? Oh, hang on a half a second while I finish this, because I think that's a great point. We should not assume that there aren't any. We should assume the opposite. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and of course, you know, the, the, there are very big type of uh, and book trades in Germany and in the US and in England, um, but there are printing histories um, in many other places in the world as well. I, I was just going to ask obviously. if you if you had been contacted by any other um, women uh, type designers or aspiring type designers or other researchers in, in your since you've published this. Yes, uh, I have been contacted by a couple of people. Um, someone who's at the University of Reading program, I think. Um, actually, just I'm kind of pulling this out of my memory now, but um, I, and maybe one other person. So uh, not too, too many, but yeah, maybe more after this presentation. Hope, yeah, hopefully we're, this isn't the end of the <laughs> By, by yeah. any means. Let's see, we got a few more um, few more questions piling up here. So folks, upvote the questions you wanna see uh, answered so that um, we can get to all of them. Um, we, uh, Chloe Friedenberg asks, have you heard of the type designer, Ange, and I'm probably gonna mispronounce this, Ange, Ange <laughs> de Gist and the, fact that she was made up to show, oh, I have heard of this. Okay. The fact that she was made up, invented to shine light on female type designers. How do you feel about creating someone, uh, a, a fake uh, persona to shine light on an issue rather than actually finding a female type designer? Ooh, controversial. Um, I haven't heard of that. Um, but obviously I think that any information that is going to confuse historians and designers and printers and confuse the record, um, I, I can't see really the value of that. Um, I think that if it was a situation where it was kind of done to make a statement and then it was kind of intentionally debunked like by the original person who did it, um, maybe to make a statement, I, I could maybe see that, but um, passing it off as actual information, I just, I think that's just confusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it, it was slightly debunked by, by the, okay. the authors of it, but. But I, I yeah, yeah, like I said, I haven't. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see what else do we have. Um, Sandra Pulido says, hello, great presentation. Just wanted to know how we can download the presentation again. Had trouble through the link given in Eventbrite. P.S. Rhapsody was my favorite font. So maybe uh, we can put that information in the chat right now i mean i can type the answer here in the q a as well if you have a um you have a link or something yeah so um first of all thank you sandra for your kind comments on the presentation and i also love rhapsody um so i think sandra is asking for the project so like the digitized version of this um and that is that is linked in the chat right, right now, but we can do it again. Um, that is the vault.library.uvic uh, web address. Okay, let me, okay, let me grab that and post it in the 
the Q and A, just in case it's not coming through for some reason. Oops. Okay. Sandra says oh. she's got it. Oh, good. Okay. So there's that. All right. I think we answered that then. Um, we have mm -hmm. a question here from Terry Fox, who says, where did you get the idea for this project? Um, thanks for the question, mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You, you got it. Your mother inspired you to pursue this project. Is that it? <laughs> yes, strong female, no, strong women uh, <laughs> um, out there working hard, doing doing their thing. That is definitely one of the inspirations for sure. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I am really interested in the relationship between um, like labor and uh, women's roles in society, um, their traditional roles and their non-traditional roles. And yeah, thanks Sabine for posting uh, that link in the chat. Um, yes, my mom's name is Terry Fox. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm really interested in that. I talked about this a little bit in the project. Um, I'm really interested in the how we value domestic labor and how um, the products of domestic labor may go unseen, uh, unstudied. Um, and yeah, I'm going on a bit of a tangent now, but um, the main inspiration for the, um, the project was uh, creating a letterpress printing that's covers for my poetry chapbook and wanting to use a typeface designed by a woman for that. And, and then it basically just kind of snowballed from there. As referenced in uh, Grendel's story about me at the beginning, I don't do anything halfway. So <laughs> here we are. Okay, awesome. I'm seeing some questions going in the chat. If you can drop those questions in the Q&A, that'll be easier for um, for me to type the answers while we're we're uh, chatting here. So drop your questions in the Q&A, please. Um, we have a question from Ayana Airakan Mans, whose name I hope I pronounced correctly, who asks, in terms of design education, what is known in regard to covering these designers and others? Design history curriculum seems to be lacking in this respect. I'll second that, other than great events like this one. Grendel, I'm so sorry. I got a little bit distracted by things going on in the chat. Can you please um, read the question? So the, the question is, um, in terms of design education, yeah. what is known in regard to covering these designers and others? Uh, design history curriculum seems to be lacking in this respect, other than great events like this one. So yeah, and I said, as a, a design educator who is, you know, uh, re you looking at and using textbooks, I uh, will agree that most textbooks do not adequately cover women, but especially uh, women type designers. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts of how we can make inroads here? Oh, um, well, I I appreciate uh, I appreciate you sharing your kind of um, sentiment on that as well, Grendel, because I think like the educators in the room are probably better well better place to answer um, that question than I am. Um, yeah, I think all marginalized histories need to be uh, need to be focused on in education. Um, um, and I think hmm, maybe the way to go about doing that is um, well, from the ground up to one extent, um, you know, um, there's more and more people, I, I hope, interested in these topics who are going to take on the research. Um, and, and introduce information to the record so that it can be added to uh, curriculum and education materials. Um, and then I also think, um, and this could just be because I'm like so steeped in policy lately, but I think it could be a policy question as well. Like what are the, 
Um, what are the policies and systems at institutions that we can leverage to ensure that that type of material is um, covered? Okay, I like that. Um, okay. Hmm. So I totally agree. I, like I have to say, as a as a design educator, I um, I'm have been uh, compelled to use certain textbooks in my for my classes that uh, definitely are lacking in terms of uh, BIPOC and women and trans and queer and etc. Um, and indigenous and uh, all of that. And the only way I've been able to get around it is by supplementing with you know, videos and other texts that I can find to uh, draw students' attention to the, the, the broader um, information that's out there. But it is hard, you have to uh, yeah. definitely take that research on yourself as an educator and you wanna break out of the usual. Um, and I just wanted to add, I think there's some really interesting, um, really interesting things being said in the, in the chat. It, Nadia says it depends on the country slash culture of the education. Um, and yeah, definitely. And then um, some other people agreeing um, that uh, certain materials lack inclusivity in terms of gender, people of color and non-Western design history. And I would say that my project doesn't in particular kind of help that issue because again, like, yes, it is uncovering women, but it is also quite Eurocentric, unfortunately. Um, so it's, it, it's, yes, it's a good kind of uh, resource, but there's definitely more work to be done. Um, and then, yeah, departments largely control curriculum content. That's kind of the point that I was trying to make, Leo, around policy and, and what systems we can leverage. Okay, that's, that's great, thanks. Beautiful, thank you. And we have one more question here. Um, we have to cut it off firm end at 1.30. So if you have more questions, we may have time for one or two more. So please put them in the chat. I mean, the Q&A, um, not the chat. Uh, Krista Carlton asks, what was the overlap of type designers and those who cast or made the type during the time Ooh. of your research? That is such a good question. Um, so uh, yes, so I am not a type historian per se. So someone else would probably give a better answer. If there are any type historians, please feel free to put your thoughts in the chat. Um, so a couple of things. I think that the realm of design and the realm of type casting, um, especially in this period, um, were pretty separate, like just in terms of the locations where these things took place. Actually, I'm not sure if that's 100% true, but what I will say is that I'm not aware that any of these women um, cast their own type. I, I think it's possible, but I'm not sure. I do know, however, that Gudrun Zaf von Hess, her and Ferdinand Ulrich has an incredible um, article about this uh, her, about the typeface Hess Antiqua and the fact that uh, Gudrun Zafon has uh, carved the punches that were used to create the matrices. Um, and that was a very kind of um, a, not a typical thing for a woman to do at the time. Um, and yeah, if you're interested in that, definitely check out uh, Ferdinand Ulrich's article. Maybe someone can post it in the chat. Um, okay. That yeah, that is that's amazing because honestly, most type designers during this period didn't carve their own punches. So for a woman to carve her yeah. own punches, that's that's amazing. Much less cast their own type, carving their own punches. That's pretty rare during this uh, time frame. So uh, that is pretty amazing. Okay. So let's check yeah, out. Yeah, thanks for Ulrich's article. Yeah, which hopefully for, someone can um, put in the chat. I'm I've got it here. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay. It looks like we don't have any more open questions. We have made excellent time. And uh, I just want to thank you again, um, Lauren Ellie, for um, 
for joining us today. And thank you everybody else who signed on for this fantastic uh, eye-opening um, presentation that we obviously need a lot more of. Um, please continue this <laughs> research, either you, Lauren Ellie, or anyone else in the audience. Um, and once again, I remind you to please join us for more letter form lectures and workshops this summer, starting on July 12th uh, with the Donian Chan on Hong Kong type. And please stay safe and healthy, my friends. Thanks again, Laura and Ellie. We're getting Thank you so of, much. A lot of accolades in the chat. And um, reminder that everybody can um, find this talk and others uh, soon after they happen on our website, letterformarchive.org. So check it out. Hey, Kendall, can I ask you, will the, does the chat like, does the chat get saved or is the chat in the recording the chat gets yeah. sent to the the p yeah thanks skill you answer it or i will yes, it does it does and the q and a will both be record are both being recorded right now and they will also uh go out with the video later on today awesome awesome so um yes that's your answer and uh, it's just been great having you. And I, I'm still seeing lots and lots of accolades coming through the uh, coming through the <laughs> chat. It's really exciting to oh. um, host talks like this. So eye opening. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Grendel, and thank yeah. you, Phil. Thank you for inviting me. This has been so great. And thanks to everyone for your participation in the chat and for your time and attention. Such an honor to be here. It's great when we get an opportunity to shine some light on underrepresented communities. Um, and thanks again, Skilla, for holding up the back end on this. You do such a great job. Oh, my God. <laughs> my work. absolute pleasure. And thank you so much, Lauren, Ellie, and Grendel. This was wonderful. I'm going to sign us out now. Have a great day. Mwah. Ciao, everybody. See you soon.